In this video, we'll go over the basics of modular arithmetic, the math of remainders. First, we'll start with the definitions, then go on to the arithmetic shortcuts it gives, before finally working through five insightful example problems. And at the end, I'll go over resources if you want to improve more. 1. The Definitions Modular arithmetic is a common and powerful tool in number theory that deals with integers and their remainders. It may feel clunky and odd at first, so feel free to pause whenever to think things over a bit. So here's the most important definition. If two integers a and b have the same remainder when divided by an integer m, we write a is congruent to b mod m. For example, 13 is congruent to 8 mod 5 because the remainder of 13 divided by 5 is 3, and the remainder of 8 divided by 5 is also 3. Here are some other examples. Now picking the statement apart, we use three horizontal lines instead of an equal sign and say congruence instead of equals to denote the same remainders. We then write mod m to indicate m is what we're dividing by. This m is called the modulus. If it's clear what mod you're working in, you can drop the mod m. Next, let's define residues, which is actually just a fancy, more formal way to say remainder. Formally, given a modulus m, the residue of an integer a is a unique integer r, such a is congruent to r mod m, and 0 is less than or equal to r is less than m. So for example, the residue of 13 mod 5 is 3, since 13 is congruent to 3 mod 5, and 0 is less than or equal to 3 is less than 5. One special case is when the residue of a number is 0. In this case, this means the number is divisible by the modulus. Like regular equations, we can use variables in our expressions as well. For example, if the statement x is congruent to 8 mod 5 means that x and 8 have the same remainder when dividing by 5. Going further, since the two have the same remainder divided by 5, they must differ by a multiple of 5. This is an important piece of logic we'll use again later. Thus, we can write that x minus 8 equals 5n for some integer n, which then rearranges to become x equals 5n plus 8, or that x is 8 more than some multiple of 5. This gives another very important way to look at the modulus statement. a congruent to b mod m means that a is b more than some multiple of m, or more mathematically, a equals mn plus b for some integer n. This interpretation of mods is one of the most useful. Now what about negative numbers? For example, what is the residue of negative 7 mod 5? Well, we can use the view just introduced. Negative 7 is 3 more than negative 10, which is a multiple of 5. So then negative 7 is congruent to 3 mod 5. You can also just repeatedly add 5 till you get above 0, since remainders don't change when adding by the modulus. I just threw a bunch of definitions out, so if you need some time to digest it, I encourage you to go back. Next, we'll be moving on to why we use modular arithmetic, the powerful shortcuts it gives. 2. Arithmetic Shortcuts One of the many powers of modular arithmetic are the many shortcuts it can give. It's easiest to show by example, so consider the following problems, which ask for the remainder dividing by 7 when adding, subtracting, and multiplying 14,569 and 2,967. Essentially what we want is the residue of each of these expressions mod 7. What modular arithmetic lets you do is replace numbers involved in addition, subtraction, or multiplication with any number they're congruent to. So in this example, after finding the remainders of the numbers mod 7, which are 2 and 6, 4, 1, 4, 5, 6, 9, and 2, 9, 6, 7 respectively, we can substitute them in and still get the right results. So then 1, 4, 5, 6, 9 plus 2, 9, 6, 7 becomes 2 plus 6, which is 8, and congruent to 1 mod 7. So 1 is the answer to part A. Then 1, 4, 5, 6, 9 minus 2, 9, 6, 7 becomes 2 minus 6, which is congruent to negative 4 and congruent to 3. So 3 is the answer to part B. Finally, 1, 4, 5, 6, 9 times 2, 9, 6, 7 becomes 2 times 6, which is 12 and congruent to 5 mod 7. So 5 is the answer to part C. To show why this works, we prove the case for multiplication. The proofs for addition and subtraction are similar. We are multiplying two numbers a1 and a2 mod m and want to replace them with b1 and b2, 
with A1 congruent to B1 and A2 congruent to B2. If you recall from before, these congruency statements mean that A1 equals MN1 plus B1 and A2 equals MN2 plus B2 for some integers N1 and N2. Substituting these values in, we can expand and factor to ultimately get some multiple of M on the left plus B1 times B2. Adding or subtracting by a multiple of m won't change the remainder when dividing by it, so we can get rid of the mess on the left to just leave b1 times b2 left. This shows that if a1 is congruent to b1 mod m and a2 is congruent to b2 mod m, then a1 times a2 is congruent to b1 times b2 mod m. Being able to reduce addition, subtraction, and multiplication is nice, but what about other operations? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Division is a bit complicated since we only use integers. I mean, what would 1 third mod 5 even be? And so that's for another time. And for powers, we can change the base as it's repeated multiplication. For example, working mod 3, 2 to the 4th is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is congruent to 5 times 5 times 5 times 5, which is 5 to the 4th. But we can't change the exponent. For example, 2 to the 4th is not congruent to 2 to the 1st, mod 3. The logic for why multiplication, addition, and subtraction can be reduced just can't be applied to exponents. There does exist something else you can use to reduce it, but that's, again, for another time. We have introduced some simple and seemingly meager tools, but with this, we can actually prove a lot. So now on to interesting and insightful problems. 3. Five insightful examples. We start off with a bit of a scary looking problem. Prove 2019 to the 2019 plus 1 is divisible by 101. Being divisible by 101 is the same as being congruent to 0 mod 101. So our goal is to show 2019 to the 2019 plus 1 is congruent to 0 mod 101. Finding the remainder of 2019 divided by 101 yields 100. So we can substitute it down to proving 100 to the 2019 plus 1 is congruent to 0. But that's not much better. The key is to realize that instead of substituting with 100, we can substitute it with negative 1 instead, as 100 is congruent to negative 1 mod 101. So we're left with negative 1 to the 2019 plus 1. And as negative 1 to anything odd is negative 1, it simplifies to negative 1 plus 1, which is 0, so we're done! The lesson to learn from this is to make sure to choose the most convenient substitutions, which isn't always the residue. The next problem is to find the last two digits of 321 to the 8th. This problem may not immediately seem like a candidate for modular arithmetic, but finding the last two digits of a number is actually the same as finding the remainder when dividing by 100. So we're looking for the residue of 321 to the 8th mod 100, which simplifies down to 21 to the 8th. Now, we could expand this to multiplying 21 8 times and reducing whenever possible, but we can shorten things a bit more. Applying power rules, 21 to the 8th is 21 squared squared squared. This is still ugly, but much more manageable, with only 3 calculations necessary. Working through it, 21 squared is 441, which is congruent to 41. 41 squared is 1681, which is congruent to 81. And 81 squared is 6561, which is congruent to 61 mod 100. So, the remainder of 321 to the 8th upon division by 100 is 61, and thus, the last two digits are 61. Our next demonstration is to prove that perfect squares never end with the digit 2. This is the same as showing that for every integer n, n squared is not congruent to 2 mod 10. First, we begin by showing this is true for all the residues mod 10, the integers 0 through 9. Chugging through, we can see that no residues have a square that ends in 2. But now, we're actually done! Every single integer is congruent to one of the residues, so every integer squared is congruent to one of the residues squared. For example, since 432 is congruent to 2, we know that 432 squared is congruent to 2 squared. 
it's a bit tricky to wrap your head around, but very convenient. As a side note, you might notice that the results of the squares are symmetric around 5. This is one challenge I have for you. Show why this is true. Feel free to share your solutions in the comments below. It may seem a bit ugly working through every single possible last digit, but it's a perfectly viable strategy, and is another strength of modular arithmetic, that there are only a finite number of residues to plow through. Next, we prove a classic, the divisibility rule for 9. The divisibility rule states that a number is divisible by 9 if and only if the sum of its digits is divisible by 9. When we represent a number with digits, such as 123, what we really mean is 1 times 10 squared plus 2 times 10 to the 1st plus 3 times 10 to the 0th. So if we take a generic number written as a string of digits, say dn, dn minus 1, dot dot dot, d1, d0, I don't mean multiplying here, by the way, this really means dn times 10 to the n plus dn minus 1 times 10 to the n minus 1 plus dot dot dot, plus d1 times 10 to the 1st, plus d0 times 10 to the 0th. Since we're interested in divisibility by 9, we take this whole mess mod 9. And here is the key substitution. 10 is congruent to 1, so this entire mess becomes d sub n times 1 to the n, plus d sub n minus 1 times 1 to the n minus 1, plus dot dot dot, plus d sub 1 times 1 to the 1, plus d sub 0 times 1 to the 0. And we're pretty much done. 1 to the anything is always 1, so this just becomes the digit sum. So this means the original number is congruent to its digit sum, so they share the same remainder when dividing by 9. Thus, if the digit sum is divisible by 9, the original number is divisible by 9 as well, and vice versa. As a side note, you can derive the divisibility rule for 11 in almost the exact same way. Finally, we end with a classical lemma. If p of x is a polynomial with integer coefficients, then p of a minus p of b over a minus b is always an integer. Working backwards, showing p of a minus p of b over a minus b is an integer means that p of a minus p of b has no remainder when dividing by a minus b. In other words, p of a minus p of b is congruent to 0 mod a minus b, which rearranges to being p of a is congruent to p of b. Since p of x is a polynomial with integer coefficients, it must look something like this, with c sub i representing the integer coefficients of each term. Substituting this representation of p in yields this nasty expression. We want this statement to be true, which would be really easy to prove if a is congruent to b mod a minus b, since we can just swap the a on one side for the b on the other. But it is! Since a minus b is congruent to 0 mod a minus b, we get that a is congruent to b mod a minus b, and we're done! If we were to write a more formal proof, we'd start with a minus b is congruent to 0 mod a minus b, and then work our way all the way back up. That was only an introduction to modular arithmetic, so if you want to gain more experience and skill in using mods, I suggest to do many interesting and insightful problems involving it. And to find such problems to practice on, I suggest the Art of Problem Solving's Alchemist site, which has a huge database of problems and solutions that lets you focus on specific topics like modular arithmetic. I'm not sponsored or anything, I just think it's a useful resource to help further you on your journey. Anyways, this is only the surface of the mathematical power modular arithmetic gives. In the future, we'll dive deeper into just how beautiful number theory can be.